Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my fourth, I think, fourth uh, Zoom webinar series. Um, my name is Flor Caspers, for those of you who don't know me, and we are joined today with um, uh, about 65 people, uh, and I expect some more people to uh, go and join, who will join us in a minute. Um, this is um, one of the things that I started doing, doing a webinar for um, sharing what I enjoy about beads, art, beadwork, glass art, um, sharing that with all of you. And I have the impression that I again have a very international audience, people from all around the world. That was me kicking my table. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, that's a lot of fun. As you may have seen in the email that I sent you about uh, uh, about an hour ago, well, exactly an hour ago, um, this is a free webinar. Uh, I enjoy talking about my work. I enjoy getting your responses. Uh, but this time I decided to see um, if people are willing to um, donate uh, anything to a specific charity that I've picked. There is a link that um, Peter will be putting into the chat. Um, so if you appreciate me doing this, there's a small foundation that, um, that I support and that you can do uh, so too through PayPal. Anyway, um, what I will be doing uh, today is very specific. It's, um, I will talk uh, in detail about how I do what I consider my conceptual beadwork. So without further ado, I am going to um, check with you um, uh, 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 share you, with you my screen and then um, we will go into what actually is conceptual beadwork. There may be some noise going on in the background. Um, my neighbours have decided that this is the perfect time to be drilling into the wall. So um, if it really gets too bad, we have closed some doors and, and I'm actually checking with Peter if he's closed the outside door as well. Um, to minimize that, if it gets too much, let me know in the chat. The chat is also the place where you can um, ask any questions uh, to let me know. Um, anyway, that's what we're going to do. I am going to be sharing my screen with you. Uh, I have so many little windows open to make sure I get everything done properly. There we go. I am now sharing. Uh, so this image, uh, uh, this image is uh, something that I will explain to you later. So this is a teaser. It is beadwork. It is art, and it is a concept. So in my opinion, it qualifies. So what do I consider conceptual beadwork, and why did I want to talk to you about conceptual beadwork? Um, I was talking to Peter. Peter is here with me. I, I always have to get him on screen just, just a little bit. No, his face, his face. He has a pretty face. See, there you go. <laughs> um, and uh, it's hay fever season. Uh, we are not in the cold of winter anymore. We're in hay fever season, so he may be coughing in the background as well. And I have cats who are making noise in the background. Anyway, what is conceptual beadwork? Conceptual beadwork is what I consider when a concept comes to life in beads. It's, I was telling to Peter, how do I actually explain this? It's the type of stuff that I make as an artist, not because it's pretty, not because it's beautiful. But then Peter said, yeah, but it can be beautiful. It's not that you're making ugly things. And he has a point there. But the idea is that I make it not because it's beautiful, doesn't mean it can't be, um, but because it's something that I wish to express. It is something that I, um, that I make as a means to explore an idea, to explore a concept, and also to make people look uh, differently, to make them look differently at um, what beadwork can do, uh, look differently at beads, look differently at um, what a sculpture actually is. Uh, and the interesting thing is by making people look at something in a different light, I also make myself look at something in a different light. And often that's something that happens at the time when I start taking the pictures. So it, usually all my beadwork pieces, it's a long process to make something out of tiny beads. 
Um, and but by the time you've finished and you start photographing it, then you see it with it in a different light. And that's um, quite important to me as well. So we could have a whole philosophical debate. You're welcome to have that debate in the chat um, on what conceptual beadwork actually is, what art really is, what a concept is, what a bead is. Welcome to have all those philosophical discussions. But I thought I'll just share um, my beadwork and the concepts that you can find in my beadwork itself. So there we go. And I wanted to uh, do that by sharing with you um, what I consider my first piece of conceptual beadwork. Um, I made this after I think I'd been beading for about two years. It's, uh, it's basically while I was working on it, it had the, the, the working title was the tea cloth. Um, the, it's about the size of a tea cloth and what I wanted to do is make something purely because I could, purely because I, I wanted to make it. It is a um, piece of uh, netted beadwork for those of you who do beadwork. It is made with size 15 beads, about 200,000 of them. Uh, and um, it's interesting, Phyllis, I can see in the chat that from this picture you said there's no photo showing, but there is. You have to look closely and I see that it kind of depends on um, how well your resolution is going, but this should show it a little bit better. Um, and this is, uh, because what it is, it's made entirely of transparent size seed beads. So um, it's difficult to photograph. It's difficult to photograph on a white background, um, but it's something that I wanted to do and while I was working on it, um, um, the process itself of making something big, it's about two feet by two feet, making something big, the process itself was the concept, was the concept of not compromising, um, wanting to do something purely because I thought it would be interesting and I didn't want to compromise by making it into pretty colours. Uh, making it more sparkly by adding things. This is what um, I wanted to make and I didn't want to compromise. When I was talking to people about this work, they could see me doing this many hours, 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 200,000 little beads. Um, they thought I was crazy. And the interesting bit is when it was finished, people could actually see, um, um, see the, the beauty in it. But again, that was not the purpose. The purpose was I wanted to make something that uh, without any compromise was purely a concept of this transparent piece of cloth um, that basically I wanted to make. You'll hear me say that a lot, I think, during this presentation. It's something I wanted to make. And in the end, that's, um, I think that's important when it comes to art. I gave a presentation this week um, for Julianne Denton, who's been doing uh, online classes and has also been doing a business course for mostly glass artists, but not only. And we talked about um, one of the things we talked about was what defines success as an artist. And I decided to that there's two criteria for me that are important. And the first one is, can I make what I want to make what I want to make because that to me is success. And the second is, um, can I inspire people? So that is also about, can you get your work out there? Can people see it? And also in this case, can I share it? This is not a piece that's been um, shared that much, except um, this photograph, which will be difficult to see, but just imagine it as a, a transparent um, tea towel hanging on your wall. Uh, I'm gonna ask Peter to um, feed my cats because they, they, they can hear me talking, they can hear the noise from the neighbours, they're like, feed us now or we will get more loud. Um, they're in a different room so they can't walk here, could be fun, but I usually like to keep them out of the bead room. So this is um, something that I was quite happy with. This um, piece, the photograph of the piece that you just saw was part of a large exhibit in Venlo in the Netherlands, where instead of advertising, 
they filled the whole city with um, with images of art, where uh, painting, sculptures. So all around the city, um, the what usually is advertisements, uh, uh, the, the large posters was now filled with art. So that was a way in which what is essentially a really delicate piece of beadwork was able to uh, to travel around to to get to see uh, a lot of people. So beadwork can be about um, really doing what you want to do. Um, it can also be about um, processing emotions. And in this case, and this is a piece I made not long after the after the big beadwork piece. This is um, one where I processed uh, a sense of loss. So it's um, it's the size and it has the feel and it has um, the, the almost the texture of a handkerchief that used to uh, belong to a um, uh, to someone who I was close to in my childhood. And she uh, she would have this with her everywhere when we were kids. Uh, um, th through uh, annoying reasons, uh, we lost touch. And a few years ago, I decided to um, make this as a memory of her and as a memory of what we lost together. Um, so this was a very um, personal way for me to connect with the beadwork, to connect with my art and to process the emotions that I uh, felt there. Um, I was, I hadn't seen this piece in a few years. I just looked at it again um, today, actually, while I was doing the final touches um, for this presentation, I realized this one should be in it. And I'm happy to say that I have now um, reconnected with this person. Um, and maybe I should ask her if she still has the handkerchief because that would be beautiful. Here's what the full piece looks like. Um, and it was, of course, it was always dirty. It had uh, a few little flowers, I remember. And how I've tried to invoke that sense of this old worn handkerchief is it has different colors of white. There's transparent white, there's opaque white. Uh, well, there's transparent, clear. There's uh, some opaque, there's some is shiny. So it gives that mottled effect that you get with age. Also, of course, it's ripped. Um, in different places, the edges have come loose. And here is a close up of it. And it feels really smooth to the touch. So there's different ways you can do conceptual beadwork just because you wanna, and you can do it to um, process something. Here is another one that is basically about processing. I made this in the the year before I turned 40, I think 40 is usually one of those um, one of those years for women that you're thinking about, about um, where am I, who am I, um, what is important to me. And what I decided to do is uh, look at 100 objects, find 100 objects that were mine and say something about me and put those into an encasement of seed beads. And the best way to uh, explain this to you is by showing you a video. So uh, I will stop sharing this one. As I said, many windows open. Start sharing another one. There we go. Go full screen. And so this is a video I made um, a while ago. Actually, I made it just after I finished it. So that would have been 2015. Um, and it shows um, pretty much everything about this project. So I'm going to let you read along and I might, um, I'm not going to show the whole video, but I'll, um, I might uh, add some things here and there, but it has text as well. So you can read along. So this is done in size 15 beads.
So there's a question for you to ponder. Which objects would you choose? I used, I got this tiny little thing and I put it in there. A bit of fun, a bit of money. Not that I have a lot, but hey. <laughs> I will, um, after I've put the video online, I will put a link to the different videos that I've shown you here. Um, I will put that in the, uh, uh, I will send an email after when I put it online so everyone can see. Um, but either way, this gives you some idea of how I felt my identity was shaped uh, six years ago, because that's when I, uh, when I made this. It's, uh, there's a lot there. I am going to pause that, uh, stop the sharing and share the other screen. I have a, I can see I have a question on the, um, um, how I, um, what I used, um, first what, what stitch I used for the handkerchief and the handkerchief stitch I used uh, is netting in size 15 beads. Um, I did a lot of netting, I think, I think 20, 2015, 2014 was a lot of netting for me because it's really um, soothing actually. And um, for the encasing of the identity piece, I used a tubular peyote stitch and often what I do is I start, uh, if I do anything tubular or a shaping, and I'll show you another piece that is um, very much um, a shaping too. Um, uh, I start with uh, what is known as three drop peyote. So that's what I use for my widest part, three drop peyote. And then I can reduce from that by going from three to two to one. Um, so that gives me a lot of flexibility to also make uh, shapes like this what need to be reduced and also um, to, uh, to make more flowy, uh, slow changes to an object. So that was identity. Um, I have now shown you a, uh, uh, quite a bit of my work, but it's not just me doing this and interestingly enough, um, after, not long after I'd made this piece identity, I came across uh, the work by David Chat. David Chat is a, um, a beadwork artist who, um, whose work is also, um, again, not that it's not beautiful, but his work is also entirely conceptual. And um, apparently a lot of what he does is encasing um, work in uh, seed beads, very often transparent seed beads. Um, so, uh, um, and actually I also found that besides this one, this piece what he did is one of his old transistor radios that he completely encased and he added the details as well. So from the outside, you can really see what it is. Um, he uses pieces that are very important to him um, emotionally in his history. And um, it was fascinating to work on this one piece identity. And I knew David Chat's work, but I didn't know that he did this basically. I'd seen some other pieces of him. Um, and to see that he'd been doing this as well, it felt um, interesting that different people, and I am by no means comparing myself to David Chat. Um, I'm, I'm a big admirer of him, but um, it's interesting to see how you can, from a very different perspective, you can come up with something uh, that is um, that is so similar. So I had a question by Mark. Uh, Mark wanted to know if the objects are encased in multiple layers or just one. The pieces I do is just one layer. It's basically a tube of beadwork. Uh, so it's just um, it's it's hollow on the inside, and I look at what the widest point is, and how long it needs to be, and that's how I encase it. David Chat's work has different layers. Um, he adds layers to it, um, to as you can see in this in this piece from the transistor radio and cassette deck that he um, he adds to it. 
another, I think, very well-known uh, conceptual bead artist is uh, Liza Lu. She, um, um, a work by her that is very well-known is The Kitchen. She has um, basically beaded over an entire kitchen uh, by, uh, um, in bright colors herself. And she has now moved on to working with uh, a group of uh, bead workers in South Africa. And they have made, um, together they have created uh, many, many pieces. And this is one of them, which is called the Continuous Mile, which is um, uh, done in a stitch with all white seed beads. And if you were to un unwrap this, because it's just, it is one continuous mile of uh, beadwork. Um, before I take you on to um, showing you a bit more of colour, because everything you've seen now, and I think uh, has all been either in white or in transparent beads, and I think a lot of you know me more for my colours. But to do that, I'm going to do a typical um, teaser thing, as in I'm going to show you a short video of why I um, of why I decided to. Um, ask for donations for this charity for this event. It really does sound like, and now we go to these messages. So now we go to these messages and I am going to uh, share a video by uh, Sayan Leyenhorst, who is a friend of mine and who can explain so much better than me um, uh, why it's a good idea to, uh, to donate to uh, the charity that, uh, that is set up by her family. So there you go. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. My name is Sian Nijenhorst and I will be telling you a bit about our foundation, Stichting Spierkracht, and what your donation could mean to us. So Stichting Spierkracht is a foundation that mostly focuses on people with muscular dystrophy. Um, and we help them cover their medical costs that are not covered by the insurance companies. These costs are not covered by the insurance companies because they refuse to invest in the future of medicine. Instead, they just pay for what treatments are available now, the conservative treatments that can do a bit of damage controls on uh, muscular dystrophy. We, however, um, help people fund new treatments, experimental treatments that can definitely improve their quality of life. Um, and we also try to help cover their uh, expenses during their treatments, so their accommodations, uh, tickets for planes, etc. Even a small donation could mean a great deal to us because it would bring us one step closer to being able to cover someone's medical costs. Thank you very much for taking the time. Um, if you have any further questions, there will be a link uh, to our website in which we have a contact form so that you can uh, email us with any questions. Thank you very much for watching. So, um, back again. So that was Sian. Uh, thank you, Sian, for explaining this uh, to me. Uh, a, little, a few technical notes. Um, some of you are saying interesting things in the chat. Uh, for example, um, Bennett, uh, you mentioned about David's work, David Chat's work. Um, if you say something in the chat, be sure to, from the little drop, the little blue drop down menu, to select all panelists and attendees, because otherwise only I can see it and then it's just me. So um, if you said something and you don't know if it was visible for everyone, um, do use the option to uh, choose both of those. So I promised you some color. So that's what I'm going to do. I am going to show you some of my um, colorful work. There we go. There we have the beautiful piece um, by Liza. And as I said, it's time for some colour. Uh, because, of course, there's a lot you can express with um, having an emotional connection. 
there's a lot you can express with um, mimicking objects in real life, but there's also a lot that you can, can express uh, and a lot of concepts that you can show with um, colors. So here's what I did for in the year 2016, which was actually the year that I was 40, and you can all do the math. I, I'm not, I'm 45 now, which I think is a good age. I think any age is a good age. It's just the age I am, so it's a good one. Um, what I decided to do starting January 1st is I chose a mix of uh, four colors every day. Um, I had my beet stash and I chose four colors every day and I made them into a little netted beading square. My birthday is always January 2nd. It's always the same. Uh, January 2nd. So it was interesting. I started January 1st and the second day I started was my birthday. Um, I picked the colours, all size 15s, um, and I made this, um, this square uh, out of them. I wasn't sure how I was going to, um, to connect them, how, what I was going to do, but I knew this was my way of doing a bead journal. And it, um, the colours that I picked were, um, they were picked for different reasons. So a simple one was on my birthday, we um, took a walk around the city of Amsterdam and we saw um, bright yellow daffodils. I do, don't usually get daffodils on my birthday. Um, I usually, it's much colder. So, but we'd had a very um, warm win winter and it felt like this present to me to have these bright yellow daffodils. So what I did is for that day, I picked bright yellows and bright greens. I have days in there where it was a crap day and my crap days usually are brown and gray and dark um, in this picture you can for example see um, i see one that has both orange and a beige and a black and i'm going to presume i haven't looked this one up it's the 7th of december uh, in the netherlands we do it the other way around the dates i don't know if you can see the dates on the little baggies um, so the 7th of December, I'm going to assume that that was a day that had highs and lows. So the orange is a bright colour, it's, it's for happy things. Um, and the black, apparently there was something that wasn't right that day either. What I did with all the squares is um, I got, uh, for every month, I got a board where I connected them to. Um, and uh, so it's basically the way you look at it at a calendar. Uh, so Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, etc. And then it starts in one corner with January, with February, uh, etc. So that's how I um, made it. And one of the things that is, I love showing my work, I love talking about my work, but this was the first time exhibiting it, exhibiting the piece, the piece is called 2017, is, um, uh, it's the first time that I got to see it in full. So I, as I said, I made the little squares first, and then I had to figure out a way how to, um, how to display them, how to hang them. Uh, and then it was time to put them all together. So I did some testing, but it was wonderful to, um, to see it come alive, to see a piece like this come alive. And this is what the entire piece looks like. Um, so uh, imagine that the squares are about, uh, I'd say, that big doesn't work for you, does it? If I show it, um, no, it's about, um, a, I think, two and a half inches each. Um, and this is the entire piece. And it, it again, looking at concepts, it's um, because this one has been exhibited in several places. I was also able to talk to people about it. First thing that it did for people is um, they started asking questions of what the colors represent. Uh, and people also started looking, and I did that too, for a pattern to have your life chronicled in colors like this um it it makes you think for example how, how do i relate to colors what do colors mean to me but also um are mondays usually happy days or not happy days it makes you think about how do i relate to work how do i relate to um my sweetie who i often see um who i often see during the weekend 
are those the good days or are, the, are, are those the bad days? So they're the good days, don't worry about it, they're the good days. Um, but usually, um, I think the whole piece is fairly colourful. What I found interesting is if you look at, I don't know if you can see, but if you look at February, so that's the second board, so in the middle, I'm not good with left and right and it's the other way around, but you can, so January 1st and then next to it is February. You can see February 5 is incredibly bright and, and orangey, it's like orange gold. Um, and what that was, that was my, the first time that I was in Tucson, um, not the first time I was in Tucson, but the first time I was in Tucson joining in the Flame Off, which is a live glass flame working competition. And I was over the moon. I was so excited to be doing that. But I was coming on with the flu. I didn't know it was, but I knew the next day. And you can see the next day, it's, there's, a, there's a very dark brown one. I was in bed all day. The day after is all gray. I was in bed. And it, it took a while for me to go back to a slight purple. It was a bad flu. Um, so that's um, one of the pieces. I got a question how the pieces are attached. Um, they're not um, permanently attached. They, uh, what I've done is I've um, put tiny uh, pins, um, nails, uh, two nails for each square. I put those, um, in, uh, I nailed those into the boards. And so by the end loops of the little squares, so the corner loops, uh, they fit onto that. Um, so that's how I did it. And this is usually um, making the pieces one part, but having it, making it so it displays in a way that um, that works, that people um, easily um, get the concept, know what it's about. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a big part of it. Uh, making it making it look good and in general um, when in doubt I go for a black background because it makes the colors uh, beadwork uh, really pop um, I had a I had a question and I know I talked about it a little bit in the beginning but I had a question of what do I consider conceptual beadwork and I'm kind of that's maybe be okay so I'm rattling a little bit because there's a lot of, um, I could say, inner monologue going on, on um, why I actually wanted to do a talk on this type of beadwork, why I think it's important to show this. And I think the, whole, the idea behind it is that very often beads, and actually more specifically, a lot of the crafts that are um, done by mostly women are not considered to be art. Um, they are considered to be um, something that you do um, when the kids have gone to bed. I don't have kids, so I've got, I can do it all day. Um, <laughs> no, I don't, I have a day job. But um, it's a lot of work that's done with needle and thread, um, that's done with beads, and uh, that's done with knitting needles, is considered um, uh, it just a craft. Uh, it's considered to be um, something that um, has to serve a purpose, either as jewellery or as um, wearables or um, um, as a tea cloth. So I wanted to show by this talk and by some of my work that um, this can be different. It can be, um, it can be more. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, I get annoyed when the, 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 um, uh, when the beadwork stuff and the embroidery stuff, I don't do embroidery, but still, um, is in the craft section. And as if it's, if it's with paint, then it's in the art section. There's overlap. Um, you can, um, you can make a painting, um, that has nothing to do with art. It's just, uh, th there's no concept behind it. Um, and you can do beadwork that has nothing. I make beadwork that has nothing to do with art or with concepts. I'm, I'm wearing a, um, a necklace that I adore. Um, uh, I love it. I like it. It's pretty. It's very wearable. I don't consider this a piece of artwork. But some of the pieces I make, I do consider them pieces of artwork. And they help me explore a concept. And um, so there you go. That's 
why it was important to me to talk about this. Uh, I think everybody will has a different definition of what, what art is. Um, I know I often get the question when I show something like this to fellow beaders, because there's also a lot of beaders who um, uh, don't quickly see the idea that beadwork can be art as well. Um, and it doesn't have to be useful. So I've had quite a few times that I've, um, I've shown one of my pieces in a beadwork group on Facebook and people will ask me, what is it? What is it for? What does it do? And then I will just answer and I will, you can't see that on Facebook, but I'll make this face. It's art. So there's nothing else to it. That's what it's for. It's intended to make you think about, um, about how beads can be used differently. And sometimes it's about um, a little bit more than that. Something that's um, uh, completely out of the realm of what normal people do with <laughs> what normal people do with beads is um, my most crazy artwork piece. It is um, I like to think of this is as the what if what if I made a blanket out of beads? What would it mean to me to make a blanket out of beads? What would it represent to people? How would people respond to it? So um, I decided to do just that. Uh, this is my biggest beadwork piece to date. I expect it, never say never, I expect it to be my biggest beadwork ever. Um, I worked on it for a year. And I know some of you may have seen this, but I am sharing the, um, the video um, that I uh, made uh, about, uh, there we go, that's my face fully in your faces again. Um, uh, I will share the video of how I made it, what it looks like, and uh, let's see what you think of that. Again, it comes with a bit of text and it is big. It's all made of size 15 seed beads. Tiny beads. So again, all of these are mixed colors. So as you can see here, it from a distance, it looks like pink, um, but it's actually uh, different. Uh, different types of um, soft pinks, uh, sparkly pinks, not so sparkly pinks, some darker colors in there. I always used like to um, mix my colors. So this is for anyone who doesn't know how beading works and how much of a process it is. And I also know for those who do beading, if you do netting or you do anything where you have to pick up more than one bead, this is a good way to do it. Um, if you're using just the one mix, uh, uh, get a little pile of it and put your needle through it. Yeah, I do beading everywhere. Um, so this was all done during a long trip through Indonesia, Borneo, but as I said, I spent a year on it, so I kept going. And I would have this, uh, this plate with me uh, and I would just feed away all the time. Makes me happy, relaxes me. And this was one that I was, um, at the end it was, it was scary because I was like, okay, so now I've made it. I've made the. I've made it into forty-six, the sixty-four little squares. Well, big squares. And then I connected it. And I was like, "Oh, is this going to work? How's it going to look?" It's big. <laughs> it's a lot of beads. Um, it's not as heavy as some people think it is, um, and that's because it's made of size fifteen pieces. Uh, and those beads are just small, so the entire piece does not take up uh, that much weight because it's not that much volume because it's smaller. So 
So this is um, it's actually not my hands, but it's somebody else who uh, who is holding it. Um, and this also gives you some idea, Robin, of how big the squares are. Um, and how it, it's glass, um, but how it moves like it is, um, like it is a cloth. I don't know if it, all of you still, um, still got that. Sorry for uh, sometimes dropping needles in the bed. Um, so I have, so the, I should know, six, so, oh, I do know. Um, the, <laughs> sorry about that. The squares are about um, one foot by one foot. No, six inches is less. Wait, am I confused now? But the entire piece is six, oh wait, yes, it's less, sorry. Uh, he, so now I have Peter sitting next to me and he is saying, no, what you're saying is wrong. I know your beads better than you do. Or probably it was in the video. Um, it's less than one feet, it's 64 squares. It's um, about six feet by six feet. So probably eight, I'm, if I've done the math before, it's 18, um, I'm sure it's 18 inches. So a question from Kristen is that I often pick uh, muted colors. Um, and if that is uh, on purpose, it's, um, uh, it is on purpose and it's um, uh, not so much that I, um, that I want it to be muted colors, it's that I want the colors to be quite natural looking. Um, a lot of my color inspiration, not so much for the piece that I just showed you, but a lot of my color inspiration for my beads comes from nature. And in nature, um, colors are never like this. It's never one block. Um, it's always different um, tones, different shades uh, coming together to make one color, to make one leaf of green. So that's why I, um, why I combine uh, different colors. It's also because I've been very lucky. Um, I... I have, I have a lot of beads. Uh, I have a lot of the colors. Uh, most of this came from when I went to Japan twice and I visited the um, Miyuki factory store. So it's a store, they have one in Tokyo and they have one in Osaka. And I just said, could I have beads of every single color? Um, and of course, if, if I paid enough, I could. <laughs> um, so I, um, that's how I got most of my 15s and that trip actually led to me being able to do a lot of the pieces that you've just seen with having so many colors at my disposal. It's a luxury and I realize not everyone who is able to, who works with beads has that luxury to have so many colors to choose from and it helped me to be more painterly with the colors than something else. And um, I have another question that is, do I typically work in components? Yes, because working on a piece that is pounds and pounds uh, and that big, um, it really helps to uh, start it smaller. Um, so I usually um, work in small components and make it bigger um, by combining them uh, later. So it's more of a practical thing um, that I work in, also because I, um, I do a lot of beading while I travel. Um, and that just makes things um, easier. Mm -hmm. If I uh, use mostly Japanese beads as opposed to Czech, I do. I started with a lot of um, Czech beads. I've also written about the history of Czech beads. I love Czech beads. But for the pieces that I make, um, um, I like that they have this very soft and um, flowy feel. And it helps the Japanese beads are very regular. So if I was to be doing something, say, bead embroidery, which again, I don't do, but who knows, um, the, uh, the fact that uh, Czech beads are a bit more uh, diverse, they're a bit more irregular, will work really well. But because I want it to be very smooth um, and I want it to not feel like anything is sticking out, that's why the Japanese beads uh, work really well for what I do. I'm going to be sharing my screen again to show you, um, I think, one of my last, uh, the, um, a few more of my pieces. 
So there we have the blankets. And I've also made, because I mentioned to you how, um, how I encased the um, pieces for uh, identity. And this is a similar method uh, by which I made a vessel out of size 15. So what I do is I use size 15 um, uh, seed beads and I use size 11 delicates. That's basically what my, uh, what my stash is and that's basically what I use. So here's me making a, a vessel, an unsupported vessel entirely out of seed beads. And it was my way to make, um, to make this. Uh, and you can see here how I started, uh, so the wide place and then um, going, uh, which is all um, three drop. And then I went and made it smaller, smaller on, uh, on the different ends. Uh, uh, the question that Mark asked is where I get my beads. Well, the best way is just to um, be incredibly fortunate, um, travel to Japan, um, go to the factory store, make sure you buy so much that you get a discount pass. Uh, <laughs> and then be broke. That's basically what you want to do, Mark. Um, but if that's not an option, <laughs> um, so uh, there's uh, there's one place in Europe uh, that I can recommend, and I can um, I can put that in the email. So I'm now telling Peter, please make a mental note for me that I put that in the email because they do ship. Um, but you do um, require it to, uh, they do require you to have a wholesale license. But I think if you have a larger order, they're willing to work with you and that, because they are the cheapest source. And beyond that, what I would do is I would um, find the type of bead you like. And um, because of course I don't buy in the US and I know most people here are buying in the US. Find a piece um, you like, uh, one specific type of bead that you like, uh, look up a few of the color codes and then check on different websites how much they are and that will give you because it, it makes no sense because um, one baggie of the same size 15 seed beads but in a different finish can cost twice as much as the other so make sure you compare prices by using the exact same type of bead and the exact same type of finish so that's a way to compare um, a good prices online and another question is how I combined the pieces of blanket together. What I usually aim for is when I add components together is that in the texture itself, and that was especially important for the blanket, um, it doesn't show up. So basically what I did is in between the parts of the blanket, I, um, I made sure I finished the outside of the blanket so they had the same number of beads for basically one square for one um, stitch you could say so by adding um, one so you have one square here one square here um, and I added basically half a stitch between all of them if you uh, look at the video again uh, somewhere towards the end there's a real close-up of um, how it's connected I connected it with transparent beads um, so it didn't detract from the whole uh, feel. Um, so look at that and then I think you'll be, it's very difficult to explain this like this, but I think if you go back into that video, it is online and I will put it in, in a, um, it, it's all on my YouTube uh, and then you will be able to see that. And if I have a different finish, I will be going back to this in a minute, but um, I just, I enjoy asking, uh, replying to your questions. Um, I like, um, I very much, there's not one favorite finish because I like all these um, and I like combining different finishes. I do like a lot of the matte finishes in the, especially in the size 15s. Um, so there you go. So that was the vessel. The vessel had a purpose um, and the vessel had as a purpose to um, get people to interact with my art. So turning it, so, um, with the blanket and with some of the other pieces, my work was really, um, it looked like textile. It felt like textile, but people then realized, wait, is this beads? I did the same with the vessel because if, um, if you've never seen something like this, you're not going to realize that this is, um, uh, that this is, made of beads it's actually glass um, and it's unsupported so again this is a piece that i enjoy showing people um, 
that this can be um, done with beads. And what I did at a um, large exhibit, this is like an art festival uh, where people could join. Um, I asked people to write something down on a piece of colored paper. Um, it could be something that they, something they wanted to get off their mind. It could be a dream. It could be um, something that they, they wanted to share with someone, but were afraid to. And they would roll, write it on the piece of paper, roll it up, put it inside the vessel. And because it was quite sturdy paper, the paper would slightly unroll and you can turn the vessel upside down and it will not come out. So it's locked in there forever. And because the pieces are colored and the bottom of the vessel is somewhat see-through, um, you can see that there's something in there. Uh, and I've promised people to, um, uh, to never sell this piece. This, this is here and it's here to stay. Uh, and I also like to get um, people who don't usually interact with art, because a lot of the art isn't for interacting with, um, like kids, um, I got them involved as well. And what I really enjoyed was um, not so much the fact that it was a bead thing, but also that um, people can, uh, they, they came up with their own ideas. They came up with, they, they had an experience and we shared it together with my art. So that's what I, um, what's what I really enjoyed. And it feels like I have now, um, I'm like now the, the guardian of, of this vessel of, uh, I think I forgot how many people, but um, I think it was um, 150 people had something in there. I, I feel like I'm now the guardian of their ideas and their dreams and the things they wanna get off their chest. Um, it's, it's a way to create um, a bond between me as an artist and them to not just be an observer. So that was um, a piece I was very happy with. Um, making. So this is what it looked like when I took my iPhone and took a picture um, looking in. You can see the first few ones and then it kept growing. Um, the pile inside kept growing and it's actually nearly full. Uh, so this is, um, it first took me a few months to work on the beadwork piece and then together with more than 100 people we made it into a, um, into a fully finished piece. So on to more fun things. No. <laughs> uh, this is the final piece of beadwork that I wanted to show you. It's one of the pieces that I'm working on now. It's not the only piece I'm working on. I usually only work on one piece um, at a time um, because that's how my mind works. It works different for different people. Um, I tend to be somewhat obsessive about my beadwork. So I focus because there's so much that usually goes on in, in, in my life with my day job, with um, writing, with volunteer work, um, that my B work, I like to be single focused. However, COVID has um, made me work on this piece, but it also has made my mind be more all over the place. So I've been working on different pieces. I have like un half finished pieces and almost finished pieces so, um, lying around. And that is typically not me, but COVID does different things for different people. Um, this piece I wanted to uh, talk to you about is uh, something that I posted not too long ago, but I wanted to share it with you again today. Today is exactly the one year anniversary in the Netherlands since we had our very first COVID infection. And not long after that, last year that we had our first COVID infection, I started a, um, uh, uh, a beadwork project that uh, shows how um, how COVID has been developing in the Netherlands. So what I've decided to do is uh, bead one piece, and you can see it really well here, bead one uh, piece, uh, uh, about half an inch for the, um, the number of infections. And those colors range from blue for very little uh, onto um, green and yellow, orange, red, uh, down to a dark purple. Uh, for uh, a lot of infections and um, they are combined with for the same day uh, a strip of beads that go from a, uh, a transparent to white to gray to dark gray for the people uh, the number of people who have passed away from COVID. So this is where we are now um, and I have it with me here it's rolled up the way you can see it um, 
and the the thing it's uh, so this is some of the last days we're not doing very well uh, at the moment we are in i don't know second lockdown whatever um the, it'll be a while before i get to travel to japan and pick out new beads um so we are now going back one year in time with this one um uh, so uh, but we'll it's it's uh, it's about i think it's more than eight meters so nine eight to nine yards this is this is this was a bad this was the bad section this is very dark um many infections and many people passing away uh, and then we head into summer summer was nice summer was 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 yellow and, and bright and um we could go outside we could uh we could even go to a restaurant with all restrictions but still we could um this was ooh, there we go ooh. <laughs> i was not planning to do that but anyway um this was um the first wave so a lot of dark colors in the grays so a lot of people who passed away but we weren't doing that much testing yet so not that high numbers in testing and then someone says it reminds me of film i i'm this is the first time i've unrolled it like this i have to pick it up from the floor in a minute um but yes it is um and that's how it started so this one is exactly one year ago we had the light blue for one infection and the very light white for no people um no people passed away that took that took a while fortunately um this is uh gosh I, have to <laughs> I know it's 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 a sad subject and i know we're all um we're all affected by it and it's it's hard working on this but this is also kind of funny yeah i have to admit it's also kind of funny i am going to um uh stop the screen sharing and um get back to you here so this is your time for um, final questions to me. Um, I'm going to ask Peter to, um, ah, there you go, because he, he's a good guy, uh, to put, you can see it's gone dark outside. I have several lights around me, but outside it's gone dark already. Um, uh, so here's the, um, uh, the donate button again for the foundation that I mentioned. Uh, and Peter will also be pointing out that uh, you have that link in your screen as well. As soon as we finish this one, you can go to a um, you can go to a uh, Zoom meeting. So it's a different link where we can chat. Uh, you can chat amongst each other uh, depending on how big the group is. Um, so I have to, um, of course. Uh, what I'm currently working on. So I'm going to once again ask Peter to go to the go away, go to the hallway. No, in the hallway is my my thing. I will I will I will show it with you. It's a little bit secret still. A little bit secret. It's um anyway, are there any questions that you have? Um I had one question still about um what type of thread I like to use. I hadn't answered yet. I use um only fireline. Um, I used four pound and five pound crystal clear fire line. Um, I like it because a lot of my projects are big and I can um, connect the threads by making them the knot and um, making a little ball at the end and pulling it so I have uh, one single so I can connect the thread. I like it because it's strong and for my bigger pieces it needs to be strong. I've actually tested for the um, for the blanket, which is six pounds, I was worried that the thread wasn't going to hold. Um, and I actually used six pound thread, but I tested it first. I made the first square and I put a hook through the square and I hung a, um, a several Coke bottles, full Coke bottles onto the hook in a bag. It was terrifying, but it helped because so, I needed to know that it could could, that it could hold. So what I'm working on now is something that I consider, um, I think you could say it's maybe like a crossover between something that I consider to be pretty and something that is uh, me trying to evoke a sense of an experience that I had. The experience that I had is um, uh, I was in Esfahan in Iran 
uh, Iran is absolutely beautiful. And um, this is a mosque. Um, it's called the Women's Mosque. And it actually has a pathway from the palace underneath the big square in, in Esfahan, so you can get to the palace. And we were there um, close to, uh, it wasn't sunset yet, but it was getting close. So, uh, and we were, it had this beautiful mosaic dome. Uh, um, and it wasn't very busy, not a lot of people there. And um, we decided to lay down on the floor. Mosques always have carpet, so that's a good thing. To lay down on the floor on our back and look up at this beautiful mosaic dome to get the whole view in. And as we were laying there, the sun started to set and the colors of the dome, of those tiles, went from, from beige to golden to orange. And it was, it was absolutely one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen and one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. And I've wanted to recreate that, that sense of that dome and those shifting colors um, in beadwork um, ever since because this is um, a while ago uh, and I'm now working on this which is made up of beaded squares but which I've worked on before and it 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 moves it um, I'm, I still haven't completely figured it out yet this is just a, still in trial but it moves like 3d tiles um it is it is it is fun um so uh this is i could do a whole piece on geometric beading um so yeah i'm not sure entirely where it's gonna go yet um but i'm just gonna go making a lot of squares again it's all ranged colors i have a lot of different colors so that's what i'm working on now um, final question we had is on the um, connecting the fire line uh, because I want to make sure that we stop on time for people who run out of time. I'm again pointing to Peter to make a mental note. There is somebody who has put a video of that's where I learned it from on connecting the, um, the thread with fire line and I will um, send you an email. So you'll see an email in a few days when I put the whole thing online so you can share it with others as well. And I will put a few links in there, including a link to the video on how to connect the knots because it has made a world of difference because I hate, I absolutely hate weaving in my threads, um, uh, which you have to do every time you're, uh, you run out of thread. And working with a really long piece of thread like this is annoying. So this is where we are. Um, Yes, that was Patrick Duggan, uh, uh, Kristen. So you can also just Google a uh, fire line connecting thread and um, Patrick Duggan and you will uh, find it too. I will also add the link to the wholesaler in the email that you will get uh, sometime next week. Tomorrow is um, a day that I'm not going to be doing anything behind the computer. Um, probably I will, but still, I'm going to pretend that I'm not going to do anything behind the computer tomorrow on Sunday. Um, Anyway, I am going to um, let you all go. Um, so uh, you are very welcome to join us in the link that I think Peter has uh, already um, uh, has already posted to the meeting link. I will finish up here, join us there. And Kristen, squeezing the blob through, if I can squeeze a blob through a size 15 bead, you can squeeze a bot blob through your uh, size 15 bead. Um, anyway, uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll see some or all of you in a few minutes. Uh, so you're going to have to wait until that one opens up. So give me a few minutes and then we will be good.